Labor Day weekend may signal the end to summer, but it doesn't mean the end of your savings at Ocean State Job Lot. Our deals stretch your dollar even as the seasons change. Update your fall fashion with new seasonal clothing, including sneakers and shoes. Close down the pool and keep it clean with a brand new commercial grade cover. Don't forget back to school supplies too. Sign up now to become an insider and get exclusive deals sent straight to your inbox. Shop now at OceanStateJobLot.com or stop by your nearest store today. Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of Jacqueline Smith, a 54-year-old woman who was stabbed to death in Baltimore, Maryland on December 1st, 2018. Keith Smith, Jacqueline's husband of almost four years, told police that he and his wife were driving home when they stopped to help a panhandler. According to Keith, his wife gave a woman $10, but a man with her wanted to thank her. Instead, Keith claimed they robbed Jacqueline and snatched her necklace and purse before stabbing her to death. Jacqueline's murder shocked the entire country. The idea that someone would be murdered for just helping was unimaginable. As it turned out, this story wasn't what it seemed. And when the truth was revealed, it was even more shocking than people would have expected. This is Jacqueline's story. The first time I heard Jacqueline's story was back in 2018, and I was shocked that someone was murdered for doing something that I participated in regularly. Many of us have given money to someone on the street, whether they're homeless or just panhandling. I live in Philadelphia, so I'm regularly approached by people asking for money. But before the story came out about Jacqueline's murder, I never really considered it to be an unsafe activity. I used to work in Center City, which is downtown Philadelphia, and I used to take the subway to work like most people who work downtown do. I used to get off at the suburban station and walk to my job, which is about seven blocks away. And a few weeks after I started working downtown, I noticed a young man that would be sitting in the stairwell. And he was there in the morning when I went to work, and he was still there in the afternoon when I went back to get on the train to go home. Honestly, he never really asked for money, but if I had it, I would give it to him or I'd buy him something to eat. One day, he even asked me to help find him some resources, so I went to work and I wrote down every single thing I could find. For Christmas, I even gave him some money so that he could buy a dicky set so that he would look clean when he went to go see his kids. There was just something about him that pulled on my heart. I wanted to help him, and he was always so grateful for anything that I did for him. And that's why when I heard what happened to Jacqueline, I felt terrible, not just for her, but for all of the people on the street who people would now be afraid to help. So many people, after hearing the initial story of Jacqueline's murder, vowed to never give a homeless person or a panhandler money ever again. Even Oprah tweeted that the story made her think twice about giving money to people on the street. I mean, it's understandable people would feel uncomfortable giving money away if a panhandler had killed Jacqueline. Problem was, the story about who killed Jacqueline and why wasn't true. And once the truth was out, it was even more unbelievable than someone killing you for trying to help them. It's a heartbreaking story about what happened to Jacqueline Smith on December 1st, 2018. But before she became a headline, Jacqueline was a successful woman who raised two sons and was living what appeared to be an idyllic life with her second husband, Keith. Jacqueline Smith was born Jacqueline Trisvane on July 4th, 1964 in Providence, Rhode Island. Anna, Jacqueline's mom, raised her along with her siblings in Providence, where she grew up most of her life. Growing up, Anna said that Jackie loved music and poetry and described her as a happy kid. Jackie attended Catholic school in Providence before attending classical high school. Jackie was an honor student throughout her schooling, her sister told WPRI in Providence. After graduating from high school in 1982, Jackie went to North Carolina A&T and majored in engineering. Jackie began her career as an electrical engineer for the Naval Underwater Systems Center in Newport, Rhode Island. 
Now, after graduating, Jackie got married to her first husband, who she had met in college, and the two started a family. Over the years, the two moved around, living in San Francisco as well as Germany, and she spent a few years working for the Navy Research Center before taking a job at Aberdeen Proving Ground, which was an Army Research Center located in Harford County, Maryland. Jackie was described as someone who was extremely hardworking and determined by those who knew her. Yet, she also had a kind heart and would do anything to help people if she could. She was also a great mom to her two boys. She loved them dearly, and everything she could do, she did to make sure that they had the best life possible. They were involved in everything from swimming to track, and Jackie was the kind of mom that would be at the meets, cheering her boys on from the stands. Unfortunately, her marriage didn't work out, and so Jackie and her husband split up and divorced in 2005. In reporting by the Baltimore Sun, Jackie settled into the home that she received after the divorce in Aberdeen. And since her job required her to travel a lot, according to her mom, Anna, when she wasn't working, Jackie really liked to stay close to her home in Maryland. Jackie got a second chance at love, it seemed, when she met Keith Smith in 2013. They met at a friend's birthday party, started dating, and three months later, Keith proposed to Jackie on Christmas Eve. And she said yes. Now, family members of Jackie said that they thought it was a little fast for the couple to be getting married, considering Jackie had just started dating him. However, they trusted her judgment because she had always made smart choices. Keith was a truck driver from Baltimore with a daughter, Valeria, whom he had raised the majority of her life. Jackie was mostly private. She didn't talk much about her marriage to Keith, but according to people close to her, she never said anything bad about it. And like I said, from the outside, their marriage appeared to be happy. I mean, I've been married for almost 11 years, and we don't have nearly as many pictures together as Keith and Jackie did. But as we've learned in this experiment that we call social media— what people post isn't always true of how their lives really are, and you can't tell what's really happening behind the pictures. But by 2018, Jackie and Keith had been married for almost four years, and they were living in Aberdeen. Her sons were all grown up by this time, her youngest was in college, and her oldest had joined the Coast Guard after graduating from college himself. Jackie was still working at the Army Research Center at the time, and it appears as if Keith was still a truck driver. Because of Jackie's schedule, it had been a couple of years since she had seen her mother, Anna. And so that year, she decided that she would surprise her mom for Thanksgiving by coming back home to Providence. Before her surprise trip home to Providence, Jackie had last seen her mom at the funeral of her sister, Roxanne, who died of cancer in March 2016. But back in 2018, Anna told the Providence Journal that she was so surprised to see her daughter standing there when she came out of her room. She said Roxanne's daughter hosted Thanksgiving at her house that year, and they ate, and they laughed, and they did what families do on holidays like Thanksgiving. Anna says Jackie's visit was short, however. She left the next day so that she could get back to Maryland. I mean, it was such a pleasant surprise for Anna and the rest of Jackie's family who hadn't seen her in a while. But a mere two weeks later, Jackie's family would have their world turned upside down. On November 30th, 2018, Jackie had plans to attend Keith's daughter Valeria's 28th birthday party. Now, it was at an American Legion Hall, and they arrived at the party around 10.30. And Keith said that they spent the night dancing, taking pictures, and celebrating with his daughter. The couple left the party shortly before midnight to go back home to Aberdeen. Keith's daughter was also with them. Keith said that they were driving through East Baltimore when they saw a woman standing on the side of the road. According to Keith, the woman was panhandling and holding what appeared to be a baby. She was also holding a sign that said, please help me feed my baby. Keith said that when they stopped at the stop sign, Jackie decided that she wanted to give the woman some money. And so Jackie reached into her wallet, rolled down her window, and gave the young woman a $10 bill. He said that the woman thanked Jackie and even said, God bless you. And then a man suddenly appeared next to her. And he said that the man asked if he could say thank you too. However, 
Instead of thanking her, Keith says that the panhandlers robbed Jackie, reaching through the window, ripping her necklace from her neck and grabbing her purse and then stabbing her several times. Bloodied and barely hanging on, Jackie had been mortally wounded in the attack. And Keith said it literally happened in the split of a second. When his wife was merely just trying to help somebody that she thought needed help. He called 911 as he drove Jackie to the hospital. And on the way there, he told the 911 operator the panhandlers stabbed his wife. He told the dispatcher that the two had run into an alleyway and that he had initially gotten out of the car to chase after them, but stopped when he realized that he needed to get his wife to the hospital. Keith was instructed to take Jackie to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore by the dispatcher. But after Jackie Smith arrived at the hospital, doctors performed life-saving measures, but it was too late. Two hours after she arrived at the hospital, she was pronounced dead. By this point, homicide detectives had been alerted to the incident by the police who responded initially to the 911 call. And they had arrived at the hospital around 1.30 a.m. to take over the investigation. The detectives were met there by Keith and Valeria, who were then taken to the police station so that they could give official statements. Keith and Valeria's accounts of Jackie's murder shocked even hardened Baltimore detectives. The thought of a husband witnessing his wife's brutal murder after just trying to help someone is hard to comprehend. By the next day, the story was making headlines in Baltimore. Even in a city where violence is a daily occurrence, Jackie's murder was really out of the ordinary. She wasn't caught in the crossfire of a shootout, nor was she doing anything high risk. She was just coming home from her stepdaughter's birthday party when she decided to help someone who was in need. Police and detectives began searching for these suspects almost immediately. They had been given a description by Keith and Valeria, and they had searched the area trying to find these alleged killers. The heinousness of the crime really captivated Baltimore from day one. The idea that someone would use a fake baby to lure someone in to rob them and kill them was just plain evil. And people knew that whoever these people were, they needed to be taken off the street immediately. The murder of Jackie quickly made national headlines also, and people around the country were shocked to learn what happened. With all of the media attention came calls for justice and reform, and Keith was leading those calls. In the days after Jackie's death, Keith started talking to the media about her murder. In these circumstances, Keith seemed like the kind of husband you'd expect. During his appearances, he was visibly upset and demanded justice for his wife, who he called his soulmate. Two days after Jackie's murder, Keith said this to WBAL 11 in Baltimore. When we see these panhandlers out and getting close proximity to your car, because like me, I'm from Baltimore, the last thing I thought that they were going to take my wife's life. And so now I got to live with that. I got to live with that every day. Keith appearing on the news alongside his daughter two days after they allegedly witnessed Jackie's murder only added to the tragedy for most of the people that heard the story. Keith's plea for justice touched the hearts of many Americans who couldn't imagine what he was going through. But Keith was not just sad. He appeared to be angry, and he pledged that he would do everything possible to make panhandling illegal. Those living on the streets were vilified loud and clear. People have always been leery of people living on the streets. The reality is that many people on the streets are battling things like mental illness and drug addiction. This isn't to say that homeless people are violent or that they harm you, but there's still a stigma. So the murder of Jackie Smith, allegedly at the hands of a panhandler, made many people vow to never help a person on the street ever again for fear that they may be next. Investigators began discovering that Keith's unbelievable story about Jackie's murder was unbelievable for a reason. And soon, Keith's story started to unravel. Those close to Jackie were skeptical about the story that Keith told them. And when the truth was revealed, their doubts were confirmed. Dedicating even a few minutes to yourself each day can go a long way. 
And Care-Off is here for support, however you spend your you time. Carve out time to take care of yourself each day, whether it's your morning vitamin pack and lemon water ritual or taking five minutes to meditate or unplug at night. With Care-Of's compostable daily packs and sustainably sourced ingredient efforts, they're aiming to help you take care of not only your wellness, but also the environment. I took the quiz and it was really easy. And at the end, I got a list of vitamins that were tailored for my personal goals. I love the fact that they came in these individual personalized packs. It makes it so easy to take my vitamins daily. For 50% off your first Care-Of order, Go to TakeCareOf.com and enter code GIRLGONE50. That's TakeCareOf.com and enter code GIRLGONE50 for 50% off your first Care Of order. Rachel Brosnahan leads an all-star cast in The Miranda Obsession, an enthralling and voyeuristic new Audible original. Inspired by a true Hollywood story set in the 1980s, where one mysterious woman developed relationships with household names, all through conversations over the phone. Billy Joel, screenwriter Buck Henry, filmmaker Paul Schrader, and record executive Richard Perry are just some of the men who fell under her spell. A fascinating look at how far some of us will go to make a connection with each other. Also starring Milo Ventimiglia and Josh Groban, listen on Audible. Go to audible.com slash the Miranda Obsession. Progressive presents Forced Metaphors about bundling your home and auto. When you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, you get great savings and round-the-clock protection, which is as beautiful as looking your firstborn child in the eyes for the first time. Well, that's a bit much. Maybe it's more like looking your second-born child in the eyes for like the third or fourth time. Point being, the savings and round-the-clock protection are really, really magical. Forced Metaphors, presented by Progressive. Bundle and protect today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. In the early morning hours of December 1st, 2018, 54-year-old Jacqueline Smith was stabbed to death while driving home from a party with her husband and his daughter. After she gave a woman $10 with what she thought was a baby, Keith Smith, her husband of three and a half years, told investigators that his wife was robbed And then the panhandler stabbed Jackie repeatedly. After Jackie's murder, people all over the country were concerned that they may be the next victim of a panhandler. And a movement started to ban people from panhandling. The news was more than shocking for Jackie's family. They were devastated. They knew that Jackie was a caring person, and so they weren't surprised that she would want to help a woman with a baby. However, Something about Keith's story just didn't sit right with them. Yes, Jackie was a caring person with a heart of gold, as she was described by her friends. But she was also very cautious. So stopping at that time of night didn't seem like something that she would do. Nonetheless, Jackie's church family held a vigil for her on December 6th. In the wake of Jackie's murder, they also demanded justice and called for changes to the law. The funeral for Jacqueline Smith was held on December 15, 2018, and Keith and his daughter were there. After Jackie was laid to rest, Keith talked to the news, saying that, quote, I hope it was worth it for that coward that took my wife's life, because you're going to have to answer for that one day. You're going to have to answer to it. Now, when it came to Jackie's murder investigation, the detectives weren't leaving any stone unturned. The description of the suspects was vague, so they were having trouble finding anyone who fit the description. From Keith and Valeria's initial statements, they pretty much knew where the alleged crime had taken place. Now, the night of the murder, they spoke to people in the area who did not recall seeing anything, and they were actually having trouble locating the crime scene. Keith said that they stopped in a neighborhood that you wouldn't typically see a panhandler in, especially at that time of night. I mean, people who ask for money usually go to places where there's a lot of traffic. Police returned to the area the next day, but neighbors insisted that panhandlers didn't hang out on that block. And also, based on what the detectives knew about that neighborhood, there were typically no panhandlers in that part of town. Most of the houses were abandoned, and there weren't many people in the neighborhood to begin with. At the time, investigators didn't know exactly what it meant, but they were suspicious. 
Keith and Jackie's car was impounded for evidence, but investigators didn't find fingerprints belonging to a possible suspect. Keith claimed that the killers took Jackie's necklace and her purse with her phone in it, so detectives in Baltimore asked their pawn shop task force to be on the lookout for those items. And a statewide search was conducted of all the pawn shops in Maryland, but none of the stolen items from the robbery turned up. Detectives hoped that if the killers had pawned the items, that they'd at least get a better description of these killers. Now, when the autopsy for Jackie was completed, it was determined that she had been stabbed five times in the chest. Stabbing someone five times in the chest says you want them dead. I mean, when people first heard the story, they figured that Jackie had been stabbed once, maybe twice. But five stab wounds? That seemed personal. Jackie's murder was a high-profile case, so the city of Baltimore wanted to find out who killed her fast. Almost all available resources were used to track down Jackie's killer. On December 3rd, two days after Jackie's murder, investigators began trying to establish the exact timeline from December 1st. They went to the hall where the birthday party was held. There, they were able to retrieve surveillance footage that captured the couple arriving at the hall and then leaving afterwards. Detectives were able to confirm that the couple had left the party at 11.45 p.m., like Keith had originally told them. Now, that same day, investigators got their first lead in the case when a confidential informant told them that a person by the name of Baby J had committed the murder. But Baby J was quickly ruled out when he was caught on surveillance footage at a motel where he had been staying with his girlfriend around the time that Jackie's murder took place. And so the lead about Baby J wasn't really a lead after all. Now, the next day, December 4th, detectives brought Keith and Valeria back into the station to ask them some more questions. However, this time when Keith spoke to detectives, he changed some parts of his story. On the night that Jackie was murdered, he told police that Jackie was stabbed after giving the woman the $10. But when he returned this time, he said that Jackie was stabbed as she gave the woman the money, not after. And that the woman was the one who grabbed the wallet, not the man, like he stated the night of the murder. Now, Keith's new account from that night was odd for detectives, but not immediately concerning. It didn't necessarily mean that he was lying. I mean, sometimes witness accounts of something like what happened to Jackie can cause people to remember things differently. After talking to Keith at the station, they drove him and Valeria to the American Legion Hall so that they could take them on the exact route that they had taken when they left the party on the 1st. Once they got the exact route, detectives began to check surveillance footage from the homes and businesses along the way, but they couldn't find any sightings of Jackie and Keith's white Audi. The fact that detectives couldn't find any footage of the car that they were traveling in along the route that Keith and Valeria had said they traveled was concerning, and it contradicted a big part of their story. Both Keith and Valeria agreed to let the police search their electronic devices and their phones. Now, as all of this was going on behind the scenes, Keith was appearing on TV for the first time. The detectives were also publicly showing off how determined they were to find Jackie's killer. However, in private, they were having trouble verifying what Keith and Valeria told them. On December 11th, 2018, four days before Jackie's funeral, detectives seized the Audi that Jack and Keith owned, and their goal was to get the GPS information from the vehicle in order to figure out exactly the route that they traveled, since the information that Keith and Valeria had given them was not panning out. Now, during the search of the car, investigators found two pairs of gloves, personal items of Valeria's, and an acrylic fingernail on the back seat that belonged to Valeria. They also sprayed the car with luminol, which is what they use along with a black light to find traces of blood that may be hard to see with the naked eye or that someone tried to clean up. Now, apart from the passenger side where Jackie was sitting, there wasn't any blood found anywhere else in the car. Now, even with the FBI's help, 
they couldn't figure out where the car went that night from the GPS. But on the same day that the warrant was executed, investigators found out that Jackie's debit cards had been being used around Baltimore. Detectives found out that a group of teenagers were the ones using the card. And so they brought them in and questioned them about Jackie's murder, but almost immediately ruled them out. They told detectives that they had found Jackie's wallet inside a Michael Kors purse at a bus stop. And so the teens were let go and they weren't charged with anything related to Jackie's death. On December 12th, investigators received the cell phone information from Keith and Valeria's phone. And the information contradicted most of the statements that they had made to police. The tower that their cell phones connected to was located in the opposite direction from where they said they traveled. And it was the first clear sign that Keith and Valeria were lying. The police had been skeptical from the beginning of their stories and had noticed some inconsistencies. But now that they had their cell phone information, they knew that they were lying about where they went after they left the party. A month later, in January 2019, police executed search warrants for Keith and Valeria's Gmail accounts, and it showed them traveling north after leaving the American Legion, not south as they had repeatedly told detectives. Now, cell phone information placed them in the area of Druid Hill Park near the Maryland Zoo. Records showed that they stayed in the area for 12 to 16 minutes before they left. Now, neither Keith or Valeria had mentioned this part of the story in any of their interviews. Police said that they asked Keith to come in again on February 12, 2019 to answer a few more questions. And Keith agreed, and he waived his right to an attorney. Detectives again asked him questions about the events of December 1st. And again, Keith changed parts of his story. Now, originally, he told detectives that the panhandler wore a blue hoodie, And now he says that she was wearing a brown jacket. He also told them that he put his car in park when the stabbing began, which didn't make any sense. Like, why didn't he try to pull off? When detectives asked Keith about his daughter's cell phone placing them at Druid Hill Park for 12 to 15 minutes, he said that he had pulled over at the park so that they could look at pictures on his phone. But... He said that he didn't mention it before because he had gotten lost and didn't want to say anything. Again, this made no sense. Why would detectives care if you got lost when they're trying to solve your wife's murder? Keith was clearly hiding something because his story was starting to fall apart. Two days after speaking to Keith, Valeria was brought in again also, and she too waived her right to counsel. Valeria was asked about her cell phone showing them in Druid Hill Park, but she denied it. After the questioning started, Valeria decided that she didn't want to talk to detectives without an attorney, and so the interview was terminated. Strangely enough, detectives found out that soon after interviewing Keith, he got in a rental car and drove to Florida, where he asked his job to relocate him. For some reason... Keith no longer wanted to be in Baltimore. Now, as information was coming in about Keith and Valeria's movements and whereabouts that day, a man who was close friends with Keith got in touch with detectives. And during the interview, the man told detectives that Keith asked his brother Vic to help him kill Jackie. According to this friend, Vic told him straight that his brother Keith asked him to help him get rid of his wife which he interpreted as meaning killing her. When the detectives brought Vic in, he claimed that Keith told him that Jackie was divorcing him. Now, the story that Jackie was killed by a panhandler never really sat well with detectives. And what they learned about Keith and Valeria in the weeks and months after Jackie's murder was painting a very different picture. All the evidence pointed in a totally different direction than they had initially thought, and it was beginning to look like they had their killer all along. As part of their investigation, detectives were able to intercept calls and texts from both Keith and Valeria's phones, and they did that for about a month. 
They were monitoring the father and daughter's activity, and they were becoming more and more suspicious. Both Keith and Valeria knew that there was a possibility that their conversations were being listened to. And so they tried to speak in codes, hoping that whoever was listening wouldn't be able to pick up the conversation. At the time, no one knew that Keith and Valeria were suspects. As far as most people knew, detectives were still looking for two panhandlers. But the three months since Jackie was murdered had taught detectives a lot of things about not just what happened that night, but also about Keith and Valeria. Apparently, Keith had a history with the law, including several bank robberies that he had served 12 years in prison for. And Valeria had a history of just outright lying about her life, her business ventures, and had also pled guilty to assault earlier that year. Neither of them were what they seemed to be. On February 28, 2019, Vic, Keith's brother, received a grand jury subpoena. Vic was supposed to testify in front of a grand jury about what he knew regarding Jackie's murder. The same day, detectives intercepted Vic's call to his brother, telling him that a grand jury had been convened. And Vic told his brother that if the grand jury found enough evidence, that they would arrest him. Now, following his conversation with Vic, he then tried to book one-way tickets to Cuba and Canada, but he wasn't allowed to book them because Keith didn't have a passport. And so he then asked if he could go to the Virgin Islands without a passport, and he was told that he could. But at the same time he was making those calls, he was also checking Google to see if he needed a passport for Jamaica and if he could get into Mexico without crossing the border. The investigation was closing in on Keith, and he obviously could feel it. Now, at this point, Keith had moved to Florida, but Valeria was still in Baltimore, and the detectives had also tapped her phones. In March 2019, Keith and Valeria decided that it was time for them to try to leave the country. Now, despite the fact that Valeria was a single mother, she left her children behind and went on the run with her father, Keith. On March 3rd, 2019, warrants were issued for the pair's arrest, and investigators held a press conference where they announced the shocking news that the story of the murdering panhandlers was a complete lie. On December 1st of last year, we received a 911 call from 52-year-old Keith Smart that his wife, Jacqueline, had been stabbed to death after giving money to a panhandler in the 1,000 block of Valley Street in East Baltimore. We now know that that was not true. Earlier this morning, after a lengthy investigation, 52-year-old Keith Smart and his daughter, 28-year-old Valeria Smith, were arrested in Harlington, Texas, near the Mexican border, and now have been charged with first-degree murder. During the course of our investigation, we developed evidence that Mr. Smith was leaving Maryland, so we made the appropriate national notifications and the Texas State Police arrested him this morning. All of our investigators prepared arrest warrants for both Keith Smart and Valeria Smith, outlining the evidence in this case to a judge who reviewed and signed the warrants for first-degree murder. Keith and Valeria were arrested 20 miles from the Mexican border and charged with first-degree murder. They were held in Texas until being extradited back to Maryland to stand trial for Jackie's murder. The entire country was shocked to learn the truth about Jackie's murder. But for her family and close friends, they weren't surprised at all. Although they never heard Jackie say anything bad about her husband, they knew that his story just didn't sound right from the beginning. There was something about him and his daughter that told them that he was lying about what happened to Jackie. In September 2019, Valeria accepted a plea deal and pled guilty to accessory to murder charges. As part of her plea deal, Valeria agreed to testify against her father. Now, Keith remained in jail after being denied bond. And after a two-year delay, partly due to COVID, Keith finally went to trial in December 2021. And during her testimony, Valeria said that the whole thing, the whole plan was concocted by her father. 
She said that after they left the party, there was some sort of detour and that Jackie was asleep in the front seat. Valeria said that her dad drove to Druid Hill Park, where he then stabbed his wife. She told the jury that as the car slowed down, that her father just reached over and stabbed Jackie. Valeria said that her father was calm before and after the murder of his wife, and that before he called 911, he threw the murder weapon into the woods. In December 2021, Keith Smith was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife. Prosecutors believe that the motive for the killing was money. They believe that Jackie was getting ready to leave Keith, and so he decided to kill her to keep her life insurance money. In February of this year, Keith was sentenced to life in prison, and Valeria received a 10-year sentence for her participation. For Jackie's family, the fact that Keith has been arrested and now convicted of Jackie's murder is bittersweet. They were happy that he was off the street, but Jackie's senseless murder at the hands of the man she had married and only been married to for four years was a devastating end to her life. Jacqueline Smith wasn't murdered by a panhandler creeping in the night waiting for their next victim. She was murdered by her husband while his daughter sat in the back seat. Jackie's family doesn't believe that Valeria was an innocent victim being puppeted by her father. They believe that she was a willing accomplice. No matter whether Jackie intended to stay married to Keith or not, I'm pretty sure that the last thing that she thought would happen was that he would murder her after celebrating his daughter's birthday. And then the performance that he puts on afterward, purely psychotic. Jacqueline had lived such an amazing life before she met Keith. She had a career. She had raised successful young Black men. She should have been getting ready for the next chapter of her life. But instead, she met Keith at a birthday party. And less than five years later, he murdered her. Jackie quickly became a national news story when the country thought a panhandler murdered her. Everybody was paying attention. But it wasn't a stranger. It wasn't a homeless person. It was the man that she married. Keith Smith will spend the rest of his life in prison, like he deserves. But Jackie's family lost a bright light, and their lives will never be the same. She was more than the woman who was killed in the panhandler hoax story. She was a mother. She was a daughter. She was a sister. And she was a friend. I hope that Keith's life sentence brings some comfort to her family. May Jacqueline Smith rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. It also helps our show grow. As always, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. For all your mortgage needs, call 973 Mortgage, M O R T G A G. Call 973 Mortgage. And leave the E off for easy. That's 973-667-8424. Also on the web at 973mortgage.com. 973mortgage is a marketing program of Peter Best Mortgage Loan Originator NMLS 1992367 with first second mortgage co of NJ NMLS 115982. Applicants must meet income and credit requirements. We are an equal opportunity lender.